Hey everyone, welcome to MIMS, Make It Make Sense. I am your host, Erica Washington, also the executive director of Make It Work Nevada. And, you know, we've been doing MIMS for a long time and we've had different iterations of it. Um, and I'm thinking that we're going to keep evolving because we want to make sure that we are um, having an, inter an interesting show, that we're having a show that... Um, really informs folks about what's going on, helping us make sense of those things, uh, but also that, you know, it's easily digestible so that we, you know, you might actually want to listen to or watch the whole thing, right? And so today specifically, I have a guest, a friend. Um, her name is Josie Calipini. She is the executive director of Family Values at Work. She's actually been on before, um, but I want us to just have a conversation because not only is she um, this really dope executive director, she's also a friend. She's somebody that I just talk to about the work, about life, about everything that's going on. And, uh, you know, and as a colleague and as somebody that understands this work that we do, and then also um, sometimes is just as lost as I am on why the heck we do this and you know, how do we make it better and how how are we helping um, change the world just a little bit? I think it's just important that we have this conversation. So this is going to look less like an interview and just more like a sister girlfriend conversation about um, all things politics and um, whatever else comes up. So I would like to now introduce my good friend, Josie Calipini, to make it make sense. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Thanks, Erica. I'm hey. so excited. And yeah, there's some stuff that really we got to talk about so we can make it make sense as much as we can anyways, because some of this stuff is whack. I just don't know. <laughs> but there is no sense to make up. <laughs> because it's kind of whack. I was, you know, trying to prep for this episode in particular, I'm like, oh, what are we going to talk about? And I started making a list of all the things. I started thinking about Ron DeSantis in Florida and CRT and, and the work he was doing. Like, I literally saw a picture um, from when he signed the bill banning CRT, which is critical race theory, which most people don't even deal with on any regular basis. It's certainly not small children. He had a picture. Um, it was a picture of all these small children. They had to be elementary school age, maybe seven, eight, nine, holding up signs that say no CRT. And a lot of them are little black kids. And I'm just like, oh, my God. Oh I'm like, God. what the, like that, it was so awful and ugly. And I, you know, as a parent, I'd be so mad if my kid was up there. Listen, I I, I want a conversation with those parents. Make that make sense. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, do y'all even understand what that means? Like they literally, it's literally um, what they call it, individual freedom, mm -hmm. excuse me, individual freedom measure, mm -hmm. which dictates what teachers can teach. And it takes away so many pieces of things that they can teach. And I'm like, I just don't understand it. If it's fact, they should be able to teach it. If it's not fact, they should leave it alone. But there's also room for, you know, opinions and, and all of that stuff, too. But I just don't understand how we are now segregating information. And then I'm wondering where it's going to happen at next. Listen, if, if that's where it's starting is in the schools, what's going to happen when people can get their hands on being able to regulate the information you can get on your phone, the information you can get on the Internet? But I also... This piece just really blows my mind because I feel like sometimes that the conversation around critical race theory or even education on what teachers are allowed to teach and what's happening in the schools is void of parental responsibilities. Listen, right. there were many times I went home asking my parents a ton of questions and they had to course correct and would offer me their opinion. I just don't understand why that's not an offering. And then, Erica, the thing I think about, too, is when you go to the hospital, they always ask for your medical history, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. The good and the bad. And you have to share the good and the bad because it's preventive. It lets so you they know. know how to treat you. So they know what the heck is going on. If you leave out the stuff, which I think a lot of people do, I always get tripped up and they're like, how many drinks do you have, you know, a week? And I'm like, I don't know what. <laughs> Cause you know, I may not even have, I might go a whole week and not drink anything, but then they're like three to five drinks, 40. Like, I don't know. Like, are you judging me? Like, cause like the other night me and Josie went out and right. I had the week's worth right, right there. Right. But you have to, but you're right. You have to give that information. So people understand like what, what exactly is happening. And so if we leave out slavery, 
if we leave out reconstruction, if we leave out all of these things, if we leave out the civil rights and even, you know, more recent things around, you know, uprisings and, and uh, you know, around Trayvon Martin and then in 2020 and all of that. And we're just going to pretend like it didn't happen. Exactly. Exactly. Like it just, it just didn't happen or or there seems to be a party that doesn't want to think analytically about why these things are happening and so you don't want to connect that to some historical some historical context come on they don't they don't at all come on it's it's really it's really crazy to me and it's dangerous because you know then there's whole entire generations of households and families that are caught up in that same narrative and Mm -hmm. they're not being exposed to anything else so they are making other generations that believe this same stuff so then that makes me think are we gonna have young black kids who don't even know their history because you know the parents may not know all of it they may know you know this that and the third but if you aren't going to a library or if you're going somewhere and those books aren't there anymore you know then it gets lost I mean this is already how our history has gotten lost in the first place is because you had so many folks who could never read or write so they couldn't write down what was happening to them and so we have a lot of histories that just will never be learned or known about and people who didn't have names um and then you have folks who were able to write down things, but those things were lost. Yeah. Or you have the, the, the few things that we do have that we're still discovering. And, and what do we do in order to um, preserve what is Black culture? I don't know. I don't know. How did you do it with your kids? Like, what? what I don't know. Because I hear your kids sometimes and I'm like, oh, but what did you do? How did you ensure that they were well-rounded in the information they received. You know, I don't know, honestly. Like, it, books are really important. Anybody who knows me knows I have a ton of books in my house. And so, and I've, oh, and I've been collecting books over the years, even when they were younger and stuff. I'm like, oh, they're going to have to read this in high school. Let me hold and grab it now and just put it on the shelf. You got to have the autobiography of Malcolm X. You got to have these different books about the movement or whatever. Um, but I just want... I think I've always made sure they ask questions. Mm. Sometimes, you know, as a parent, I feel like they ask too many questions. But at the same time, I need them to be inquisitive. Like, don't just take whatever is said as the final truth. You know, push back and ask more so that you can understand. And then use the internet as a way to research and to learn. Like, YouTube can be your friend in a lot of ways if you know how to utilize it correctly. But I think more than anything, it's just a matter of, be if, if if you have pride in the fact that you're black, if you yeah. have pride in the fact that, you know, whatever, you know, your your nationality is and all of that, then you know, you want to be inquisitive and know more about it as yeah. much as possible. Yeah. And so I think that, you know, I luckily they didn't have the issue of this whole banning things in school. I mean, nobody knew anything about CRT, you know, years ago or what have you. It's been around and it still had nothing to do with, you know, elementary or junior high school students. But understanding how these things affect one another, as I was learning them, I think I was also telling my kids because there's a lot of things I didn't know as a kid. I didn't know as a teenager. I had no idea how these dots connected to slavery and mass incarceration and poverty and the, you know, urban you know, development and, and the, um, you know, the amount of pollution that's in a poor community versus a, um, a more wealthy community, you know, redlining, all of these things I learned probably closer to an adult. So as I'm learning them, I'm telling them about them and they're probably not giving two shits, honestly, you know, <laughs> when I'm saying it and they're just like, what? Okay, yeah. mom, whatever. And I just share articles or send stuff to them. And, you know, I had really encouraged my oldest. I remember, to join the Black Student Union in high school. Yeah. And he was like, no. And I'm like, y'all want to join? Like, uh-uh, why? And all my friends, we see each other the same. We don't have any issues. I don't think we need to do that and separate us. Ooh. And we had a whole conversation about it. And then it was some years later that Trayvon Martin happened. Mm. And after that happened, um, there were conversations that were had between um 
friends and there were very polarizing conversations. And I think that was when my kid realized that we all, all, we are not the same and we do not think about things the same and we, and and we are not raised the same and, and their ideologies and, and, and their politics are not our politics all of the time. And so, you know, I think it was kind of a rude awakening, honestly, when that happened, because, um, you know, it was an automatic response. I didn't have to I didn't have to tell my kid to be angry or to be shocked and upset that this thing happened. Yes. It just was. But 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 her friends were like, you know, maybe he was doing something. And she was just like, I don't, I don't understand this. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, I think I will say that as frustrating as it feels for me on a day-by-day basis watching some of the stuff that's happening at the state level, at the national level, some of the conversations that are happening in the news that are debating whether or not actual things that happened happen. As frustrating as it is for me in these moments, I am so hopeful about what's coming in future generations because of the work that, you know, parents like you have done, but also I hear so many of the generations that are coming behind us being like, who cares? You know, like, you know, I I will have a whole conversation with one of my teenage uh, mentees about critical race theory and the debate for this and the debate for that. And, and, or like the other day I was having a conversation with them about how there's all these attempts to narrowly define people's identities. And his reaction was literally like, who cares? Why do they care about that? And I feel like in addition to having advocates, the more people we can just have who are like, who cares about that? Why is that even important? Why is that the most important thing? Which feels like the generations behind us are like, who cares? I just want a good paying job that will allow me to work part time and travel the rest of the time. I, I'm like, that's that's what, so I have a lot of hope in, in generations, like Skylar's generation and other, you know, and, and right. folks. <laughs> you know, yeah, I, Skylar said something to me one day about work and, and, and Skylar's my kid for whoever doesn't know that. Uh, she said, uh, I don't want to work to live. I just want to work to do I'll do that work, but then, you know, that's not my life. I want to be doing other things, have fun. And I don't know that I grew up that way. Um, Mm -hmm. I grew up thinking you had to grow up and and get a job. And that was the thing. Like I grew up in, you know, the eighties and I remember watching the movie baby boom with Diane Keaton. Uh And I just knew that that was going to be my life. I was going to move to New York. I was going to have some great job in this city, be walking to work in my little easy spirit tennis shoes and my power suit on and working 80 hours a week because that seemed like the thing to do. Like that was success Uh was to work a lot and, you know, obviously make good money and all of that. But in my mind and also, you know, I think how I was raised is you have to work hard and you have to go to work every day and all this and not so much as like, I just want to do enough work so I can pay my bills. But that's not my life. That's not what I want to do. And I think that that's the thing that people are missing when they say people don't want to work anymore. I don't think people don't want to make their own money and that they don't want to take pride in something they do. They don't want to be tied to a desk 40, 50, 60 hours a week in order to do the thing, because then you're doing the thing and and, and then you're buying the houses or the cars or whatever, but you have no time to use them or spend yeah. time in them because you're spending all the time doing work instead of exploring the world and meeting new people and traveling and yes. having a good time. Because having a good time sounds frowned upon from the world I came from. It's like, yes. you're just getting ready to go on vacation again. Didn't you just do that? You know, yes. you just want to go and lay down and take a nap. You know, oh, I so love the nap ministries. Me the idea too. Of like, Go take a nap. And it's just like, well, I was supposed to take a nap when I was four. But now if I take a nap in the middle of the day, they was like, oh, yes. Does she she hear about her organization? Does she want to do the work if she needs a nap? Exactly. Oh, Erica, I just reread. Well, I actually did an audio, but I just reread Rest is Resistance and did a book club talk on it. And I was talking, you know, I. I was reflecting. First, on- what is the book about? Let's tell people. Oh, because I don't even know what this book is about. Rest is resist. Rest as resistance is a book by I think it's Trisha Harvey, um, and it is about how 
we need rest and how rest is actually is like direct activism and resistance against capitalism and against the against the sort of grind and hustle culture and mentality. Mm -hmm. um, and the author just makes a powerful point about how um, you know we we come from a history of enslaved labor where folks you know had to work around the clock and the labor laws in this country. Um, were not meant to optimize people's humanity and the wellness of our bodies. And so I was just thinking about how like, you know, this culture, it, it just keeps us so busy and so crazy busy. It centers productivity as the most valuable thing. Right. Um, and there are generations that look at rest and equate it with laziness, lack of motivation, mm -hmm. when actually... I don't know any genius ideas that have come from the edge of our burnouts. <laughs> right, right. And I was doing the math. I mean, I want to be I want to be Skylar when I grow up, because when I was doing the math, I was like, OK, so the life expectancy of um, of black women is like, I think it's 72 Something, yeah. or 77 now and it keeps going down and it keeps up. going down. And so you mean to tell me that I got to work starting at 16 and actually i just saw a headline speaking of make it make sense where governor i put that in quotes because i got all sorts of feelings about it but governor huckabee um, <laughs> is, <laughs> <good old Sarah. laughs> we just gonna call her sarah if yeah. I don't know her. <laughs> do you know that she is trying to increase the flexibility of when people can start work to either 12 or 14 so you mean to tell me? So we're moving that, back in the child labor laws. We're rolling uh, that back. Exactly. So you mean to tell me that I work from 12 to 65 and actually the cost of living means many people are living longer, but also working into later years. So I work from 12 years old to 67, 70. And then I get to enjoy retirement for two to seven years before I die. No, I'm not trying to give my whole entire life to a system. And then people who get who retire and then have to go back to work because they can't afford to retire. And then you'll see a, a like a what they call like a feel good story or something in the news about how somebody raised money for this 85 year old. It was recently and I'm, and I'm, you know, getting it. I'm gonna get all the numbers wrong. I saw that. The, jan man. the janitor. The janitor. He was like in his eighties or something and had to go back to work because he couldn't afford his house or something it's like that. Right. So they, right. So they, so they did a fundraiser or something for him. And it was like this whole sweet thing. And I was like, he is 80 something and can't afford his home. His home is not paid off and he has, has to go back to work. The story is not about fundraising for this yes. person. The story is about how is this person not able to just live at that point? 80 something years. I, I, that's when you should be thinking about nap ministries all day long. <laughs> oh, I mean, that makes no long. sense to me. And I don't want to be that person. And and it's not going to be just because I don't want to be that person, but we don't know what life brings us. Exactly. And as much money as there's never enough money. You can't exactly. save enough money. My yep. 401k is not going to be enough. Yep. And in the way the prices of everything have gone up, it's never going to be enough. So yep. how do I know I'm going to not still have to work at 80 years old because, yep. you know, I need to eat and have a roof over my head. Like exactly. it just doesn't make any sense. Exactly. It doesn't make any sense. So it blows my mind to hear that there are states that are thinking about making flexible. Mm -hmm. I, I love when I see that term because I'm like, oh, you want some fuck shit. Let me read the fine print when people right. are talking about making something flexible. And just like a just like a um, real call. Hold on. Keep talking. <laughs> so when people are talking about making things flexible, I just look like, so you're going to require people to work younger. And I think it's actually because they can't raise the retirement age. They're, they are failing to raise the retirement age. So why not make people start working when they're younger? It is absolutely ridiculous. And I will say that one of the things that we absolutely have to do is we have to keep having these conversations. 
We have to talk about what's happening in our states. We got to talk about what our elected officials are doing. And we have to talk about how they impact our day-to-day -day lives, our personhood, and our families and communities. If we're not talking about it and all we do is get up and go to work and we're not paying attention to what's happening around us, that's forcing us to live the life that we, we are living versus the life we want to be living, that's going to be a problem. Yeah. Just so everybody knows, that was my Postmates because I ordered food an hour ago and he's just <laughs> getting here and he's like, he's lost and he doesn't know. And I was just like, sir, I'm recording something live and like having a really important conversation and I need my food also because it's hot. I would like it to be hot because I just got off a flight this morning and I haven't eaten since like 4 a.m. But yeah, so that's that's because that's how life goes. Yes. Um, and but people are working these side hustles like uh, Uber and Postmates and yes. you know whatever else is out there um, shipped. I think it is um, where Target delivers or whatever. Yeah. All of these places and people are doing this as supplement income. Yeah, um, or they're doing it as their main source, but then they don't get any sort of pay family leave or yep. you know child care stipends or um, unemployment uh, or or anything. If anything happens, they don't, they don't even have medical. And yeah, a lot of people are using GoFundMes to pay for medical bills or to pay for a funeral. Like you don't have life insurance and all of these things. Like these are, these are those family values at work that we're trying to figure out. And this is the work that we're trying to do. And I, and it makes me think about like this work that we, that we do on a regular basis. And it made me think about what you do, which is, yeah. Similar to what I do, but at a, on, a, on a larger scale. But I was just thinking, like, do people even understand the work that you do? Does your family, does your, do your parents know what the heck it is that you do? <laughs> um, I have, you know, I spent the last two years actually doing a funny personal experiment of trying my 30 second pitch of describing what I do to my mom and to my girlfriends because nobody fully understands what I do. Um, and, you know, it is very, it's very complex. So to try to describe it all feels really hard to do. But when you're, you know, when you're an advocate um, and you're an advocate that's trying to make change in the world, um, it's hard to conceptualize because people can understand what it means to, you know, change the trash can. But when you say to people that you're trying to change the way workplaces function, like nobody can imagine what that means. Um, but I will say that I've had the most luck. I'm curious what you tell people. <laughs> I, I tell I've had the most luck telling people that I'm an advocate, an activist and a lobbyist. When I say that, people sort of have an, an image of what that means, you know, and, but then I get these questions that are like, so have you met the president? And I'm like, you know, it's a little bit more than that, you know, or then if people understand, if I say something specifically like, oh, you know, we're trying to make sure that people have paid sick days. So then someone will be like, oh, so I work for such and such and I'm trying to uh, get my medical needs taken care of. Do you know what Medicaid can do? Cause I'm trying, and I'm like, well, it's not quite that either. So I don't know, you know, I don't think anyone really knows what I do. My, um, my youngest brother, he's 23. He's always like, sometimes I think you work for the mafia because occasionally I see you with pictures. <laughs> He's like, I see you with pictures at the White House. And then the next day you're in California. And then the <laughs> I just snorted. I literally just snorted. It. Like, you know, you're out here breaking kneecaps. And right, right. And, and, and doing these, these shady deals in the dark. So. I know. I mean, but I mean, sometimes that's what it feels like. <laughs> Listen, I don't know. What do you tell people you do? How do you explain it? You know, as much as I've tried to say that, you know, I run a nonprofit organization that advocates for and with Black women around, you know, reproductive justice issues, which covers basically everything um, and work on policy. But when I say lobbying, that's usually what people are like. Mm. Mm -hmm. So you're a lobbyist, and I'm like, not <laughs> lobbyist because I don't make no kind of money to be that kind of lobbyist. Yeah, I'm not that kind of lobbyist. I'm not the lobbyist like they see in the movie. There's that one movie with, um, yeah, I can't remember Jessica Chase and Chasson something. However you say her name, she got red hair. Mm -hmm. It's a good movie. She's a lobbyist. I don't do that. 
and I'll make a kind of money. No, I'll, I'll run around in five inch Louis Vuitton heels either. But Let's you know, it. I you know, even saying activists and people just think you're out marching and walking yes. the streets or whatever, yeah. and 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 there that happens sometimes. But I think you know, some folks think I'm a politician, and I'm just like that ain't it at that all it. ever. Yep. But it's just really just about advocacy, and and when I say advocacy, it's just about you know supporting and trying to make a better world, um, the world that I want to live in, the world that I want to leave to my children, whatever pieces and ways I can do that, um, whatever things I can push forward, whatever policies I can read and try to change to make better. So, Because a lot of times policies are put forward and someone says, oh, that sounds good. We should do that without really reading enough into it. And then it's like, why did we put that together? Like I can think back to like the 90s before I was old enough to do anything. Um, and this man still can't find me with my food. I swear <laughs> to God. So, yeah, I think that trying to explain what I do is hard because, well, one, I always tell people, I didn't know this job existed as a kid. When people are like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Or even as a young adult. I didn't know this was a thing. I knew there were people who ran nonprofits. But when you think of a nonprofit, I think of like Salvation Army or, you know, something along those lines, um, United Way, all really large things that do things for people. Yeah. Right. And and not in the sense of that there were nonprofits that worked on policy that tried to build up momentum to get people to push back on the things that they could change because I didn't even know you could change it. I was a mom, a very young mom. You know, we got uh, WIC, food stamps, Medicaid, all those things. I would not have been able to survive if I didn't have those things, if I yeah. wasn't able to utilize them. Skylar was on a formula that cost almost $50 a can. I would have never been able to afford that by myself without WIC. And, you know, at one point I was making too much money and got kicked off. And by too much money, if I remember correctly, I was making like $25,000 a year, $25,000 a year. Where is and that, that too much money? I, I, it ain't no, it ain't too much money nowhere. And so but it was too much money to qualify for WIC anymore. And so I think about that. No one ever talked to me about politics. Nobody ever talked to me about policy. Nobody ever talked to me about this this baseline of this income threshold is something that could change if we, you know, have conversations about it. If we lobby, you know, whether paid or unpaid, the right people at the federal and the state government to say, you know, I need more. And, and the people who need to do this type of lobbying are the people who are directly affected. At that time, it would have been me. And now it's folks who are currently receiving WIC or food stamps or what have you, because they're in the process of cutting food stamps again. Again. At the price of food right now, which is astronomical, now you're going to cut food stamps again. again. That makes no sense to me. Yep. And yet the folks who food stamps are being cut are the folks that we want to talk to, but they're also sometimes the hardest folks to reach because they are busy trying to figure out how to make it work. Yes. Yes. It's, it's really crazy to really think about how sometimes it feels like our work, um, you know, I often dream about my work meaning that I'm going to work myself out of a job. But I feel well, that's like, what we're supposed to do, right? We're supposed to work supposed ourselves to out of a job. But, but then we can just go on vacation, right? You just go on vacation, right? You're just resting and taking a nap, right? But it really feels like we're dealing with the same issues every 10 years. Like there's a 10 year cycle where something happens and it's the same issues again, just worse because you're talking about a $50 can of formula in the midst of a formula shortage that just happened a year, two years ago. That Well, it came to the national level right. a couple of years ago, though many people were already experiencing it. So I don't know. It, it The work feels meaningful and hard. It's hard to explain, of course. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I feel like it's changing all the time. Um, so that's the other thing that I sort of I sort of struggle with. Um, and I don't know how you feel about, you know, the, like the responsibility of this work is a lot because if we get it right, the impact is so, you know, is so far reaching. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with sort of like the weight of the responsibility of this job? 
I have three to four drinks a week, according to <laughs> <me>. <laughs> Marijuana is legal in, a, in in quite a few states, um, which is something to be grateful for. Yep. Uh, you know, for me, it is heavy. And I was just at, on another call this morning with one of our leadership coaches for some from folks on our team where I talk about like to be able to do this work as the executive director is um, heavy. It's yeah. heavy and it's lonely because yeah. so much weight is on you. And part of this weight, you know, we put on ourselves because I said, yeah, I want to do yeah. this. And I love the job. Like, I absolutely positively couldn't say more about how much I love this job and this work because I am able to do something that does mean something to me. So yeah. there isn't a lot of air between Erica, the person and Erica, the executive director and Erica, the mom and Erica, the wife and all these things, like all these things get layered together yeah. because all these things matter to me yeah. too. Like yeah. I care about the cost of food. I care that people are able to afford, even if I'm not on food stamps anymore, I care about the people who are and who need to be able to feed their children and themselves and feed them well and feed them with yeah, food that is low quality. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, and that, they, that they're able to afford formula and diapers and that they're able to uh, be heard by their doctors when they go in and they say they feel pain. Yes. And yes. so I feel like uh, the work is it, it's 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 so heavy because I feel like if I don't do what I what I set out to do, just my little small part, mind you, my little small part, if I don't do that part that I'm letting part of my community down even though they don't they may not even know what I'm trying to do yeah um, but I've set an intention out there and because yeah. I'm a person of my word yeah. then I feel like I have to come through with it so no matter if I feel sick or if I'm tired or whatever and this gets into that point of I don't rest enough sometimes yeah. I got more, I've got more vacation days and sick days that I haven't used and I fight for people to have paid sick days and paid vacation days and I and I don't even barely use mine because it's just kind of how my, my brain works and it's not necessarily healthy. I'm not advocating for anybody not to take their time off and do the things that they need to do. Right, right, right. We can't do that. <laughs> but things feel very urgent all the time. All the time. And so, so then yeah. you have to figure out that balance of like, how urgent is this? And if I don't do it, will somebody else pick up the slack and, yeah. and do the thing? Or is the thing still going to be there when I come back? Because it will. Yeah. And as much as I'd like to work myself out of a job, I probably won't, yeah. you know, I'll probably retire and, and carry on and I will yeah. be long gone and the work will still need to happen because like you said, there seems to be these cycles of every 10 years or so where yeah. people just get involved in all sort of nonsense and we seem to forget ourselves and we don't become human enough to realize that whatever happens to the lesser happens to the greater at the yes. same time. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if it, the work feels really heavy to me, but I also, I don't know, I just sit there and constantly think about all of the things that the work isn't far, you know, I, I can immediately think about myself and what I need. I can think about my sister who just had a baby. Um, oh, she was yeah. a... Yeah. Very cute little baby too. Yes, I know. My sister who just had a baby, she was a travel nurse, right? Like essential workers. We heard about essential workers, celebrated essential workers. But as a travel nurse who went to some of the hardest places hit by COVID, um, she has no benefits because she's a contractor. <laughs> and so she just had a baby. Her husband is a PhD um, student. And so he doesn't have paid leave. And so now they're, you know, just had a baby trying to figure out new life, new world with a baby without any public benefits. The hospital bills are starting to roll in. So I, bet. I can think about them. And she was a preemie. And she was a preemie. So they, they charge extra when you come early. Oh my gosh. When they were talking about the bills yesterday, I was like, how is she at six weeks old and is already over a half million dollar worth of baby thanks to that hospital stay? I'm like, hey. Either that or she's in debt already. Be oh, like, yeah. so are we putting this on your credit already. or not? So I don't, I think about them. I think about my mom who's retired mm -hmm. and she retired a little bit early. She had to make the decision of retiring early 
early and getting less from her social security than if she had worked three more years, but she was tired and over it and needed to rest. I think about I think about her. I think about my dad who died a year after retiring. He didn't even get to enjoy his retirement years. Um, and I think about, my, you know, like the work isn't far when I think about how heavy it is, how much our systems and our environments need to change and why we all have to be, we all have to be agents of change, whether it's in, whether it's part of your job description or not, we all have to be agents of change in order to secure a different kind of life, a different kind of future. I just want something different for my niece than what my, and it's frustrating to have to see generations, right? Like I saw my parents deal with a ton of issues. Now I'm looking at myself and my sibling groups and my friend group dealing with the same issues. And I'm like, how, how do we break this? If not, if not for this work and if not for doing this work, doing it with rest, but we still, <laughs> Right. Doing it with rest and yeah. figuring out how we actually like put that into practice because I believe in it. Yeah. I yeah. completely believe in it, but it is very difficult for me to do. And I've gotten better. I have gotten better over the years um, than what I was in like 2018, 2019, 2020. Like I was just like, go, 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 yeah. go. And yeah. at some point I was just like, this is kind of dumb. Yeah. And the work will still have to be there. Now, mind you, when I do rest and I come back and my email has 3000 emails in it, then I'm just like, dang, did why I did I do this? Right. <laughs> I did this to myself. But at the same time, I realized my inbox is probably never going to be empty. And if I owe you an email, you might want to reply. You might want to bump it back up. Yeah. I, 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 may, I may not ever see it. By the yep. time I get to the end, I'll be answering somebody from two years ago. I'll be like, so, <laughs> did you still need me to send that to you? Oh, see, you're good for keeping two-year-old emails. As soon as January 1st, 12.01 a.m., I clear my whole inbox. I'm really? like, I do. Oh, it my is, God, I'm going to anxiety. I'm like, what if I miss something? I'm telling you, it is very You know, I might not ever read it, but it needs to stay there in case I get to a point where I get a chance to read it. Erica, I'm telling you, it causes me a ton of anxiety, but I do it anyways because I'm like, I am just... I'm never going to be able to keep up the way I want to keep up. And that's just going to be the reality of it. Um, mm, you, <laughs> just like, just be like, just delete. Like it didn't happen. Select all and delete. <laughs> I don't think you understand. That sounds very really life changing and scary at the same time to my type A personality. Like that sounds awful but it is I really mean, at the same time it would just be gone and be like I don't have it I didn't get it I mean I have deleters regret for about for about three or four days but then I, I just I just get over it I just get over it okay Erica so wait when you think about all this stuff that we have to do me and you often talk about like what is our responsibility what's the responsibility of us as people, as a community, as employers and organizations, like what's our responsibility? And then what's the responsibility of the government and of our governments? You know, me and you sometimes go back and forth and we're like, these governments are not gonna save us, you know? But does that mean, does that mean that we just don't do the work to try to change governments? Like, what do you, what do you think? Make the government make sense to me. Because sometimes I just want to throw it all. I just I mean, want to throw is, it all that away. That is the name of the show. We were today. We're trying to make the government make sense. <laughs> I don't know that I can make the government make sense. I think that a lot of stuff. I feel like I just want to throw it all away and burn it down and start over. Like yeah. some of the stuff is just like y'all just y'all started wrong and then you just keep going the wrong direction and it's just getting worse and not better. And I think that we've made it where the government is on purpose sounds overly complicated than it actually is or actually needs to be. And then you have people, there's enough distraction to say, that's boring, that's dull, that's not nothing to do with me. I'm going to go and watch The Bachelor. Yeah. And I can tell you all about The Bachelor. I can tell you, we'll watch whole, um, you know, trials of like Johnny Depp and old girl, what's her name, Amber. <laughs> You know, people were were they were deep into that, but people weren't watching the impeachment stuff. You know, yeah. uh, and and it's just well, I mean, and they didn't make it as interesting, you right? Know? Right. But, yeah, but I don't. But at the same time, how do you make that interesting? How do you make yeah. the Supreme Court 
um, uh, nominations more interesting? And, and do we need to make it interesting or do you just need to know about the thing, right? And so I, I think our responsibility is to remind people that y'all are actually in charge. Like we, the people are actually in charge and the people that we vote into office are the people to go do the things we tell them to go do. Yes. Like I, I, I am now um, giving you directive and saying, hey, groceries are too high. Yes. Go and fix it. Go fix it. And I expect it to be done post haste by the end of the month. Yes. Figure it out. Yes. This is what you need to be doing. But they spend so much time you know, some folks like actually trying to do their job, but a part of their job is to fundraise to campaign all over again. And that's like half of their job. So yeah. then you have, you know, the whole money and politics thing. And that could be a whole nother conversation about, yeah. you know, how much money people need to raise and how much they spend on ads and mail and how much hell we spend as an organization on mail to during an election to remind people to go vote. Go Even vote. though I know people know to go vote, if they don't go vote, it's probably because they just don't want to, yeah. not so much because they don't realize that there is an election. Right. I mean, yeah, some people, yeah, some people might not realize there's a primary um, or something like that, but a presidential election, people know what's happening. People know. People yeah. So, like, it ain't, you know, had nothing to do with me. Nothing's going to change. You yeah. Know? My yeah. grandfather used to say, you know, all politicians were crooks, you know, but, you know, that was like the Nixon time. And so, yeah. <laughs> you know, I feel like, if it's not sensational, people aren't interested. And I think it's our job to start with the smaller things and let people know that they can change whatever is happening to them. And everything that's happening to them is not necessarily their fault. It's not because you didn't work hard enough yeah. or you don't have enough education or you don't have X, Y, and Z. And that's why you don't have paid leave. And that's why you can't afford your medical bills. Or that's why you have a doctor who, you know, doesn't listen to anything that you say, or this is why you yeah. can't seem to keep your head above water instead of yeah. there, is, there is individual responsibility that we all have to like yeah. take care of our stuff. Yeah. But when all of us have these same struggles, then is it our fault or is it a structural problem that needs to be torn down and rebuilt so that we're all on this equal playing ground? Yeah. And I think that getting people to understand that and then and pushing back and saying, yeah, no, that's not what we're about to do. Because we'll do that in other situations, you know, right. situations. Right. And like, I'm not going to let you disrespect me, you know, out the street. You're going to have those kind of folks. So I need you to say that same thing to your congressperson or whatever, exactly. you know, whoever's out here doing something like, yeah, you're not about to disrespect me like this. This is, this is not that time. And, and you don't know me like that. Exactly. Exactly. It's that same energy, but bringing mm -hmm. it to our elected officials and to the government. And, you know, I really strongly believe in the idea that we have to reimagine what state governments look like and what the federal government looks like. Reimagine the structures, the way it operates. Do I think do I think that they operate perfectly? Absolutely not. Do I think it's really problematic? Of course. And do I have my moments where I'm like, what is the point of doing all of this? Of course. But the reality is just, just because people feel like it's not worth it doesn't mean that what they are doing doesn't impact our lives, right? Mm -hmm. And so if, you, if we're not going to play, they're still going to keep doing what they're doing. It's going to impact our lives, whether it's about taxes and how our taxes are being used to fund, me, fund quality schools in our own neighborhoods. or How our taxes are being used to fund Cop City. Cop City. Like and I don't feel like enough people know about Cop City in Atlanta and what and, and taxpayers are paying to build this state of the art, you know, giant. I mean, I can't I don't even know how many acres it is, but it's super giant because yep. they're called it a city. But yep. Cop City and where they're training more cops, more cops to do what? Like explain to me why we need more cops but we don't need more social workers but we don't need you know uh more more teachers and we need we need better a better foundation yeah. that has less holes in it that people fall through when they have less of an education because it comes down to when you don't have an education sometimes you end up in a life of crime when you when you come from poverty yeah. and don't know how to get out of poverty it can't get out don't even not, not even necessarily that you don't know how to get out of it yeah. but you can't get out of it because the system is set up, but you're going to say we need more cops. Yeah. But yet you'll have some folks come out of prison, serve their time, 
you know, because allegedly this is the, what the system says it does. It's supposed to be rehabilitating. Rehabilitation, you. When right? When you come out, you're supposed to become, you know, a returning citizen and be able to do X, Y, and Z. But then you come out and some places you can't vote. Yeah. And then some places they'll, you know, they you, you'll have banned the box where they'll say that they're not looking at X, Y, and Z. But if they find out that you have a conviction, they will pay you less. Yeah. You will, they find out you have a conviction, they will charge you more for an apartment. Yeah. They'll charge you three times the rent, or they'll say you can't live here because of this. Yeah. You can't get student loans if you have certain convictions. Yeah. Yet, but then, and then somebody might return into some life of crime again. Yeah. And doing something. And well, why would they do that? They must like prison. They must want to be in prison. They don't know how to get themselves together. But you keep setting things up. And then you have just predatory lenders. Then you're going to charge them a higher interest rate because then they don't have any credit because they don't have any history because they have been in prison. And it's just a circle. And so then they commit a crime. And it's like, well, we need more cops. Yeah. And how? Like, how does that make any kind of sense? And that's that's exactly, it's those little things, you know, you and I were talking about. It's things like, cop city that people aren't paying attention to is things like what um the article you share with me about how um where is it where they are trying yes in yes in jackson where they are basically saying they're going to bring in state police to manage a city when cities have their own local governing bodies and police so basically you are calling in the state troopers to manage a city because that's what we're seeing things like that, seeing where and, then, and, and, and something about that. And I really want people to look that up because they're calling it the new Jim Crow because they're also allowing the um, uh, judges to have to not be elected, that they are going to just be appointed by another judge to do the thing. Yes. And so then you're taking elections out of some of these things. And so people are just appointing whoever they want to appoint. And we know how those things work. It's nepotism all the time. All the time. And nepotism doesn't work enough for other people. They work for a small set amount of people, except for Skylar, who is a production, uh, who produces this show. <laughs> nepotism gets you to produce this great show. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but past that, you know, to, in order in order to have anything, if you don't know, you got to know the right person or what have you. And then, or if you if you know the wrong people, then you end up saying in, in you know some of these wrong situations yeah. as well. Um, I it just it just I mean that's that's exactly the problem. Like we have to pay attention to these things that are happening because for the champions of oppression and injustice, they use those things as models. So if you, if a city can suddenly say that, or if an elected official can suddenly say that this city doesn't get to have its own government, its own police, its own governing structures. And, and, they, have actually, a, and they have a black mayor. And they and have a black mayor. It's a mostly black city. Mm -hmm. And if you get to say that and then say, we're going to bring in our own police and actually you don't get to vote in your judges anymore. We're just going to appoint your judges. This is it's a hostile but quiet takeover. And see what happens is if we're not paying attention to those things, they become models for other areas. So it might be happening over there. But before you know it, it's in your own backyard. And if we're not paying attention and getting involved and bringing that same energy we were talking about to our elected officials and to our governments, when some function is happening, it we are giving them permission to assault us on so many. All the, and saying we we enjoy it. We enjoy I wanna, it. I want to read what this says so people understand what we're talking about, and you, and and hopefully folks will. will We'll hit the Google and, and and dive deeper into it. But the Mississippi State House passed House Bill 1020, uh, mostly upon, mostly along party lines last mm -hmm. month, mm -hmm. sending the proposal to the state Senate. The legislation would establish a separate court system for part of the state's capital city, which is Jackson, with judges appointed by the state chief judge, mm -hmm. justice, and the area under the system's jurisdiction patrolled by the state-run police force. Most of the areas impacted are more predominantly white neighborhoods in the city. And so what I'm getting from that is we are going to have a separate little area that is policed just by us. 
Yeah. And 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 we're picking who who does whatever. And so if something bad does happen over there, we're gonna decide how they are punished instead. And then everywhere else that's poor and black, you are gonna be just in the penal system. Yes. And but over here you get you get a whole separate set of people and 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 laws and, and judges and all of that. It like it it makes no sense to me how this is passing and it just makes me think because as we know in these different states laws just copycat each other yes. when somebody's done it over there it's a gateway drug and yes. next, you know oh y'all did that I can yes. do that too. oh how y'all let me see how you because then it's all written down and you can yes. see how they did it and next thing you know Nevada you know could be uh up against something like that yep. and it wouldn't surprise me you know we are not as Nevada, we are not a, a, a blue state the way people seem to think that we are. We have we have had a Democratic majority in a lot of situations, but we're pretty purple. We flock yeah. back and forth and you have enough folks here, enough conservative folks here, enough you know right wing folks here, enough Trump type folks here, enough whatever kind of folks here yeah. who might think that this is a good idea yeah. and, and we'll bring it forth. And so if we're not thinking about it early enough. And combating it, yep. then we're going to be in the same position trying to fight something after it's already made it in somehow. Yep. It's, it's, like we're exactly. always, it's like we miss stuff. And I don't yep. and I don't I don't want to say that no one pays attention or thinks about it, because I don't know if that's a true statement. A lot of the times people just don't know yeah. because when you watch the news, they say they, they repeat the same three or four stories over and over and yes. over again. If you watch in CNN or MSNBC or Fox or any of them, they talk about the same stuff, the top of the hour and the middle of the hour. Yeah. And they miss so many things. And then the local news is talking about just a couple of those things. And then they get, they feel good story with a puppy. And then you miss everything else that's actually yeah. matters and people need to know about. And so I'm hoping that a show like this may help with some of that. Yes. We, you know, we don't get a chance to dive as deep as we may, we may want to, but enough information for y'all to go and look it up and look see. It up. And so you know, so you know what's happening around you and what's happening in another state does affect what's happening in your state, yeah. whether that's Nevada, whether that's Missouri, whether that's Maryland or Tennessee yeah. or wherever yeah. else. If it's happening there, it could happen here, and we oh, need yeah. to be we need to be on high alert. Oh, yeah. We need to be on high alert all the time. You know, I'm from Illinois, and this is one of those perfect examples where sometimes the state is purple, sometimes it feels blue, but there are pockets that are, a majority of the pockets are red. And these are the, the sort of the sort of copycat bills that start to spread like wildfire. And before you know it, there's hundreds and hundreds of local cities that are now operating like this. And I just, you know, we have to think about these things in very real terms. So if you are a city that has its own government, its own mayor, its own way of doing things, you're a majority black city with a black mayor, imagine, okay, you are sitting in your house, chilling, right? Erica, you are the mayor of your house. You got your own household. Now somebody from the next time over shows up at your door, busts your door down and says, actually, I'm the mayor now of this house. I'm going to do things the way I want to do them. Actually, this is not how we're out of nowhere. You don't even know who these people are. They don't represent your community. They don't look like you. You don't even know what their intentions are, what, what they are thinking about you, your family, and your future, and your household. We wouldn't allow that in our own household. And that's how we have, we have to think about these things in that way. This is how gerrymandering started to happen. This is how restriction of voting rights started to happen. This yeah. is how our injustice system got to where it was. It's these small pockets of things that happen. And then yeah. they get copied across city, across city, until it's a statewide law, until you've got people in Congress, DeSantis and other folks that want to take up really crazy and salacious and, you know, crazy laws and duplicate them then for the whole country. So we have to pay attention. Oh yeah. Cause now DeSantis is ready to take it national and, you know, run for president. He like, he already I, I, I can show you that. Like, let me show you how I'm, I'm messing up Florida. Let me just mess up the whole country. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm about to show you how I can do it all over the place. You too can have, you know, uh, these really crappy laws. Yes. 
Yes, you already know. You know, there was a, I have to be honest, there was a point in time when I had some level of respect for the Republican Party. I had talked mm -hmm. to members on the Hill. I had talked to different state elected folks where you could have a real um, logical values-based conversation that was really about getting to a collective shared outcome about how to move forward. And now it feels like the craziest folks of that party have the loudest microphone, the largest platform. It's because they come reality TV and it went from reality TV used to be like just like house hunters and stuff like that, which I still enjoy. But and then it went to, oh, but we gotta have a fight. Like someone has to fight somewhere in order yeah. to get really more ratings. And then people are like, well, what's, you know, you know, how, how are, how, how are we keeping viewers and the viewers have to be kept because some, you know, some housewives have to pull each other's hair or something yeah. has to happen. Yeah. And, and um, I think it feels the same with, with the party. And I mean, I don't know the democratic party, they have their own set of issues as well yeah. um, in a different way, but yeah. you know, they're, it's all it's all a lot of show. I tell people all the time. It reminds me of the musical Razzle um, of Chicago. Yeah, and the song specifically Razzle Dazzle, which if you've never seen Chicago, you can watch the movie version with Richard Gere and um, you know Renee Zellweger and all of that. It's fun too. But if the Richard Gere does a scene, he's singing the song Razzle Dazzle, and he's basically saying, you know, watch what I do over here, but don't pay attention to what I do over here. And as long as I you know, tap dance and do all this stuff. This is what y'all are paying attention to. And you're not, you're missing all of this over here. And it's just a show. And I'm just putting on a show for you and y'all will enjoy it. And yeah. the whole, the whole, actually the whole musical, which was done a, a super long time ago is still like, it's so relevant to me now yeah. as to how government works and all of that. It's just like, what is the most salacious thing we put out there? And as soon as that dies down, we got to have something bigger and better. Something if we don't bigger. have something bigger and better, no one's paying attention. But then at the same time, that's when all these little laws are, are going through because people aren't reading all of these things because who has time? You know, I don't time? even have time to sit there, sit there and read through all the federal laws that come through when, a, when the new Congress starts or even in the yeah. state. When, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of bills that come through every yeah. year, every session, no one has time to read all of those. And then yeah. even if you have a bill that's about one thing, they'll slide something else in there about something else. And you don't know it's there because again, you don't have time to read all these things, but you're yeah. hoping that people are honest and that they're At doing least. what they say they're going to do. Yeah. But that's the problem. And we got the one dude who's not honest about anything who is now uh, in Congress, whatever his name is. Do, is, it, is it his real name? I mean, come I on. Not. And the fact that he's still there. Like, if that's not enough for people to look like, we are so fucked. Yes. Because yes. we've got yes. to be sworn in, even yes. though after the fact, they're like, we don't even know what his name is. He didn't go to school here. He didn't have this job. We don't know. You know, he is wanted in, I think, Chile. For, yes. <laughs> for He is, or Brazil. I think he is wanted, you know, for questioning, like all of these things. And you can still run. Run. Run, and, run the government. And still have a majority of your party Back, be like be silent or back you up. Yeah, like, like, oh, that's crazy. And Erica, I think about um we have to talk about this Tennessee law that bans drag queen shows. Have you seen this? Because <laughs> there's nothing else better to do but but ban drag queens. Like no matter how you feel about your, you know, um, uh, about gay folks or what have you, or uh, not not even necessarily that you have to be gay to do drag anyway. Yeah. But, you know, that's what it seems to me is that it's just a way to scare people and, and, and silence a whole LGBTQIA plus community. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I was texting yesterday and I was like, so what if you was just in drag and singing karaoke? Yeah. Or what if you weren't in drag? What if you are a transgendered person yes. because the way the bill oops the way the bill is is written it's not about being in drag as yeah. a you're saying you're a drag performer it's about dressing in a way that is different from your assigned identity at yes. birth yes so if i put on a suit 
mistake a suit and a mustache as even a Halloween costume. Yeah. Does that count? You know, but if you are a actual, if you are a transgendered person and this is how you identify and you go sing karaoke, is that bad too? Like, I don't understand because they're like, they're trying to keep stuff away out of a, you know, it's being an 18 plus area or whatever. But karaoke, I know you can do in a lot of places. It's not necessarily a bar. It doesn't have yep. to be 21 and up. Yep. You could be out just performing. It could be. Yep. The, the state fair yeah. or something. I don't know. You could be anywhere. And I I feel like there's just so many other things that need to be worked on. And this is not even a thing. Like you yeah. literally spent time and money. How much money did you spend? Did you spend on this. All of this. Everybody who had to work on this, their salaries. Yes. And this yes. is what you spend your money and your time on when we have people who can't, who who don't have homes. Yeah. People who are starving. Who are people homeless. who can't afford health care. poverty rate is... 6% higher than the U.S. poverty, average poverty rate. But we're thinking about the wrong thing. You mean to tell me that your poverty rate is higher than the national average and the thing you want to do and focus on is ban um, drag queen shows? And let's not forget that hidden in that same law is banning access for transgender minors to health care. So there are there are like bombs being hidden within these others, you know, more salacious yeah. bills. Because you don't bring that part up because then it just sounds like this fluffy thing. And it's like, well, I can't even worry about that because that's just you're just saying that drag queens can't perform somewhere exactly. whatever. I'm not going to think about that law. But then you dig down deeper into it. Exactly. You're actually denying people their human right to uh, accessible and equitable health care. Exactly. And even though the law, this is the thing that I think, too, we have to understand in this work and in becoming public advocates for our communities is even if I don't do drag, even if that's not my thing, even if no one close to me does drag, I have to be able to connect the dots of how it impacts me. So when I think about, OK, Tennessee just passed this law that bans doing drag or cabaret performances in the presence of children, bans them from occurring from schools and public, you know, all of these things mm -hmm. that, you know, I might look at and say, you know what, that doesn't really affect me. But if someone wants to read into this subjectively, right, and they see me rocking a fade walking down the street and they think that me rocking a fade does not align with the gender they perceive me as, mm -hmm. they can literally look at that and interpret that law as saying, you look like a boy with that boy haircut and that is not allowed because that is not according to your gender. And now I've got a misdemeanor charge for having a fade walking down the street with my niece. And then that misdemeanor could keep you from getting a job. A job. You see, like, so we have to, we have to realize that all of these things impact us. Even when we think they don't, we have to take a closer look because if it doesn't look like they're directly coming for us, they're still coming for us. Oh, they're coming for us. They're coming up for us in ways we can't even recognize that they're coming up for, yeah. us, for us in a way. Yeah. Huh. One of the ways we have to make government make sense is by making sure that we are keeping top of mind the real priorities, the real things that are important. Listen, you want to do a drag queen show? Go do that. But what I'm going to need you to do, what I hired you for, what I elected you for is to fix this poverty rate in Tennessee. Right. OK, right. that's not what you ran on. I'm pretty sure none of them ran on. On none you know, of that stuff. Who does I get into office? No more drag queens. No more drag queens. That's, not, that's not why people voted for you. I cannot imagine that that's why people voted for any of those votes. Yes. Yeah. So one of the ways I think we make government make sense is by continuing to lift our voices and by engaging, by knowing who's in office and by making sure that they're hearing from us on a regular basis to make sure that they know what the real priorities are. Don't spend your work time. We're both, we all, Erica, you and I know about employees and work time. <laughs> Don't spend your work time on this bull. Focus right. on the priorities. Can, and you imagine, can you imagine? I cannot imagine that I have, you know, a team full of folks and, you know, you're supposed to be doing X, Y, and Z and be like, but look what I did over here. I, we, we worked on drag queens. 
what does that got to do with anything I asked you to do? I asked like you to nothing. do. Well, as as an as an uh, as a boss or as a parent, I can't imagine as a parent. You know, I tell my kids to go clean their room, and then they go build a sandcastle. But look at this thing that I—that's not what I asked you to do. Yeah. And it's like that's what I get from these some of these lawmakers. It's like you had no discipline at home. You just could, yeah. you just went out and did whatever you felt like doing, and nobody yeah. held you accountable for what you were actually supposed, supposed to, do, to do. So you're gonna do something else. Yep. Yeah. All right. Look, we could talk all day about <laughs> these things, but the food that I was chasing around for the last two hours is cold now, so I'm gonna eat it. But I want to thank you for this conversation. I want to thank you for bringing up so many issues that hopefully folks um, already knew about. But if they didn't, they've learned something, and they will. Um, take this information and research it and find out more yeah. so that we can make sure that we are advocating for our communities, wh whichever your community is. The community could be how you identify by race or by gender or by, you know, demographic, you know, or geographic neighborhood wise or what have you, all of those different communities that intersect, they matter. And we need to make sure that we are protecting them because we have to live there. We have to live yeah. in the skin. We have to live in these bodies and we have to live in these neighborhoods and we have to make sure that the people we put in office take us seriously yeah. because um you know i think i don't think nobody want to be considered a punk but you know at this point some of us i feel like that's how they treating us as voters like we're punks and yeah. i think that's what we be thinking about going into 2024 uh you will not be punking me no nope, you will not be see that's that's the electoral t-shirt right there you're not right. me <laughs> you will not be punking me that 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 might be it you heard it here let me go figure out get this design together yeah well but thank you for, Josie of course thanks for having me I can't wait to figure out the next thing we talk about well we're gonna talk <laughs> about Biden's budget apparently let's go see what Biden's doing I missed the meeting so we're gonna have to catch up and see what Biden is budgeting for and hopefully it's for some stuff that actually makes sense for us it, I think it makes a little bit of sense now if Congress can make it make sense then we'll be we'll be on a good path forward then we'll, we'll come back and we'll talk about it all yeah. right y'all thank you so much for thank tuning you. in to make it make sense we will be back with another episode in two weeks and uh yeah that's it so hopefully please leave comments you know hopefully as y'all uh watch this episode let us know what you think again it's a little bit of a different format than we've normally done tell us what you think about that too if you like it you hate it whatever i got decently thick skin you can tell me how you really feel uh but we just want to make sure that we are doing our part out here in these uh progressive streets so we'll see you next time Thanks.